This morning's Torah portion is called Va'era, and it is very similar to the fourth Torah portion in the annual cycle of Torah readings, which is called Va'era as well. Uh, Ra means to see or to be seen, and so the context of Va'era is God is appearing to Moses and to Pharaoh, and he's going to appear with his promises of redemption and salvation, and and you're going to see that made manifest in him saving the Israelites from Egypt with the plagues. And we're going to be looking at the first seven of the plagues this morning. You can find it in your Bibles in Shemot or Exodus chapter 6 verse 2 through 9 verse 35. And chapter 6 is going to focus on God revealing himself or appearing to Moshe for the first time as yod heh vav -He, as Yahava, And we talked about the meaning of the name last week. It says that he before appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai. So we're going to talk about the meaning of El Shaddai in correlation with Yahava and see some deep uh, significance in how God is revealing his beautiful nature of selfless love further in his act of salvation. In chapter 7, we cover the first plague, and that was blood. The uh, Nile turned to blood. Chapter 8, we see from frogs across the land to flies, plagues 2 through 4. And in chapter 9, we're going to see the plagues that uh, came as pestilence upon the cattle in plague 5 to hail in plague 7. It's interesting that the Tor portion ends in the middle of the plagues. Plague 7 happens to be the same plague that we see in the end days. There's only 7 plagues instead of 10 plagues in the last days. So I think it's significant that God told Moses to end the Torah portion there because it is correlating with the redemption of the Messianic age. The plain meaning this morning in the parties is that God is revealing himself. He's appearing. He's being seen to deliver and to save and to fulfill his promises that he gave to Abraham. So we're going to look at these seven I wills that are in Exodus 6 and look at how they relate to what he had previously told Abraham but who had not fulfilled them until this time. And we see in God's character that he manifests himself at different times to save us. He's a saving God. And in these seven promises of God, we see hidden glimpses of Messiah as the ultimate Savior and Deliverer. Then in the plagues, we're going to talk about a correlation between how each plague was addressing a different false god in Egypt. And so the application for us today is it's time for us to let go of all of the idols in our lives and to come out of spiritual Egypt. And we're going to talk about the symbolism of God's name right in the beginning. Here in the Hebrew, you see an interesting correlation with God revealing himself because it says right off the bat, Vaidabar Elohim. El Moshe. So this is and the Word. Now who's the Word? We know the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then we see Elohim. Elohim is the title of God that we see in Genesis 1 created the heavens and the earth. So God is moving from a general manifestation of himself as the creator as Elohim to more specifically the Word. And then, and the Word has kind of a a rigidness or uh, uh, more harshness to it where somebody can give you a word and it sounds kind of strict but then when they say something to you it's more soft and this is the way God's name is moving is from more of a general harsh view of oh this is the God of the universe to an intimate God of love in that the phrase moves from Vayadabar Elohim El Moshe to Vayomer and he said to him so he's not just giving his harsh word but he's coming down intimate and speaking to him. Ele Ani Yahava. So now he's moving from the word of Elohim to this intimate Yod Heh Vav Heh. And then it says, 
Va'era, the title of our Torah portion, and appeared El Abraham, El Yitzhak, Va'el Yaakov. He appeared to Abraham, to Yaakov, to Yitzhak, and to Yaakov, Ba'el Shaddai. In the past, he had revealed himself as El Shaddai to them. Ushimi Yahava, but my name, Yahava, Lo Nodaati Lachim, but my name, Yahava, they did not know. So right off the bat in this Torah portion, he's moving from the word of the Almighty God to Yahavah, and then revealing that in the past people knew him as El Shaddai, but now he's going to reveal himself as Yahavah. Why is this? When you see El Shaddai, one of the interesting things first, I guess, about Debar is you can see that the root here, Debar for word, is the Dalit and then the Beit and the Resh. Now the word Bar also means son in Aramaic, which comes from the Hebrew. And the Dalit is like a door. So literally in the word, we see the Paleo-Hebrew hinting at the way of the sun being revealed. And it's being revealed even more specifically in this yod heh vav heh in how he's going to manifest himself and not only save Egypt, but save the world from their sins in the future. Because the yod, which is the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, denotes his selfless nature. So selfless that he would even lay down his life. And the hey means to behold. So the yod is a hand and the hey is like a window. It means behold the hand. And then the vav is a nail and the hay is a window. So literally in the yod hay vav hay, there's a future glimpse of the sacrifice of Yeshua in behold the hand, behold the nail. But then he reveals, in the past, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov knew me as El Shaddai. And El Shaddai has the root die in it. Now we say on Passover, Dayenu, right? It's enough. It would have been enough if God had just delivered us from Egypt. But then he took us to Sinai and he gave us the Torah. Dayenu. It would have been enough if he just gave us the Torah. But then he provided for us for 40 years in the wilderness. And we go on and on. And it's all about God's sufficiency in providing for us. So El Shaddai, and we see the Shekinah or the eternal flame that is enough, has a connotation of sufficient enough mercy and compassion. Like, I revealed enough mercy to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I revealed enough compassion where they could get to know my character is merciful and compassion. But now I'm going to reveal something to you that is even beyond El Shaddai, the yod heh vav -Hey, that when you say it without adding to it or subtracting from it, you hear Yahava, self-existent father of love. Hava means self-existent one. Av means father. And Ahava is love. So literally in this name, you hear the three Hebrew words that convey his character on a deeper, more intimate level of selfless love. And this is what he's moving Moses to understand before he allows the plagues to fall upon Egypt. So that way there's no question as to where the plagues are coming from and what is his character. He said to him, I am Yahava. I appeared to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov as El Shaddai. Although I did not make myself known to them by my name, yod heh vav -Heh. Also with them, I established my covenant to give them the land of Canaan, the land where they would wander about and live as foreigners. So he's establishing right here that what I'm about to do was already established in my covenant given to them. So we're going to correlate these seven promises in Exodus 6 with the original promise that he gave to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians are keeping in slavery, and I have remembered my covenant with them. Therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am Yahavah. And now we see the very first of his promises. I will free you from the forced labor of the Egyptians. This is the source, Exodus 6, verse 6 through 9, for the four cups at Passover. 
These are the I wills, but we're going to find that there's more I wills than what are represented by cups at Passover. And we're going to look at a correlation with the origin of these four cups in the different levels of estrangement from God that God is healing. You know, he inspired Peter to talk about the promises. And when Peter was talking about the promises, these are the promises he's talking about. It says that God has made to us precious and magnificent promises. According as his divine power, he has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. So when we get a new name revealed to us, it's revealing a different character attribute or a deeper knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby he has given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Because if we see in that Yahava that he's the self-existent father of selfless love, then by beholding, we become changed into that divine nature. That's why it's so important for us to understand him through his name. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And the key to escaping the corruption is that selfless life where we deny the false self, the ego. We die to self daily after his example. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to your virtue, add knowledge. Knowledge of Him. And to knowledge, add temperance. What is temperance? It's like self-control. It's moderation. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. The character of God. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, selfless, life-giving, unconditional love. God is taking us from our basic faith of the past to a more intimate understanding of His character so that we can, by beholding it, become changed and develop our characters from faith to virtue to knowledge to self-control to patience to being recreated in His image, ultimately, in His unconditional love. So, if Peter is referring to the promises of God, we should know what they are, right? And that's what we're reading right here in Exodus 6 and 7. There's seven precious and magnificent promises. I call them the I wills. Because if you just talk about the four cups, there's actually a lot more I wills than cups. And so people might think there's only four promises. But if you look carefully, you'll actually find that there's seven. Let's go through them. We just read, I will free you. So the very first I will promise is that God's going to free us. And we call this the cup of salvation at Pesach time. And it is the first cup that we drink at the Seder. Then he says, and I will rescue you or deliver you from your oppression. We call this the cup of deliverance. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. In prophecy, whenever you see this mention of the outstretched arm, it's always a hidden glimpse of Yeshua, the Word being made flesh to redeem us. That's called the cup of redemption, and that's the third cup that we drink. Now what's interesting, in Yeshua's Last Supper, He drank these three cups with His disciples, His Talmidium, but He didn't drink the fourth. And look why. The fourth and the fifth cups, or the fourth and the fifth promises, relate to the fourth cup, which is, I will take you for my people. This is bridal language. This is intimate language. This is what happens in his second coming when he comes back for the marriage supper of the Lamb. That hadn't happened yet, so he was not partaking of that. And that's why he says, I will not partake of this cup of the fruit of the vine again until I do with you in my kingdom. It says that I will take you as my people, intimate, bridal language, and I will be your God. So these two go together. Then, once this has happened in essence, this then, you will know I am Yahavah Eloheinu. I am Yahavah, your God. Once I take you as my people, like a husband takes his wife, and I become to you your personal, intimate God, 
and you become one with me, then you will know me even as I know you. Then you will know me even as Adam knew Eve. This word knowing has a deep connotation of intimacy, to be at one. So this is why this phrase, then you will know that I am Yahavah, comes after he is referring to the future marriage supper of the Lamb, where he takes us as his bride. You will know that I am Yahavah Eloheinu, who freed you from the forced labor of the Egyptians. And then, verse 8 says, And I, another promise, will bring you to the land. I call this the cup of inheritance. He's promising to return us to the land. After years of being in the diaspora in exile, he promises that he will regather the exiles of Israel and return us to the land which he swore to give to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. And then he further says, I will, the seventh I will, give it to you as a heritage or as an inheritance. Or we might even think within the context of the wedding that's happening as a dowry. It's going to become ours. It's the inheritance that was given to our our father Yaakov and it's passed down to us as his descendants isn't this beautiful seven beautiful promises that Peter refers to that are being fulfilled both in the first coming and the second coming of Yeshua we see that he has freed us from our sin he has delivered us from our oppression he has redeemed us and we are looking forward to we are actually between the third and the fourth cup the time when he comes back and takes us intimately as his bridal people. And he reveals God more fully to us and returns us to the land and gives us our inheritance. So where do all of these promises, what are these promises doing here in Exodus? God is basically reminding Moses of the prophecy that he gave Abraham. He prophesied to Abraham that his descendants would be numerous, but that they would be strangers in uh, a land that was not theirs. Well, let's look at that. Genesis 15, verse 13. He said to Abraham, Know of a surety that my seed, that thy seed, shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. So I find four elements in this original promise, if you will. What it is, is God's revealing history in advance to Abraham. And now in Exodus, he's saying, basically, I told Abraham what would happen to his descendants, but I wasn't able to free them, deliver them, or redeem them until now. I wasn't able to fulfill my promises. He said that they would be a stranger, right? Which means they're estranged, just like us. Isaiah says, Thy sins have made a separation between thee and thy God. Do you know nobody could take us by force when we were in the land as long as we were, our forefathers were walking according to the ancient principles of Hashem in Torah? But once they sin, which is the transgression of the Torah, then it opened up the door for them to be taken from the land and to be estranged from God in a foreign land. He says, The land is not going to be theirs. You know, this prophecy, it says 400 years started from the time of Isaac's birth. So, what does this mean? It's not just talking about Egypt, in essence. It means that even Isaac and Jacob lived as foreigners, even in the land of Canaan, because the promise to give Canaan to them had not yet been fulfilled. Remember, there were still giants in the land. The Canaanites were still there. So, this is a talking about the prophetic promise is going to take 400 years to actually give you the land and to reverse these things. Through sin, we become estranged from God. We end up leaving the land and going to a land that's not ours. Then in that land, further through sin, we become slaves to sin. So you can look at this symbolically, not only physically in the context of our people's um, exile from the land and slavery in Egypt, but our estrangement from God and our slavery to sin in a land that is not ours. Here we are only temporary in this land. Our inheritance is in Israel. But we have to be overcomers to return to the land. And what's the fourth thing? First you get enslaved, but sometimes slavery is not that bad. Slavery gets worse when you become oppressed and afflicted. 
And so there's four elements here that God was revealing would happen to the descendants of Israel that he is reversing now in this Exodus story. God always starts with saving the most trou troubled first and then works in reverse. So look at how these promises are actually starting with the oppressed and the afflicted. He says, I will free you. What's interesting is when you see that Judah was afflicted in the lands of their dispersion, like in Germany and the Holocaust, who has he sent back to the land first? Who has he freed and sent back to the land? Judah, because the most heinous things were happening to them. The northern ten tribes have hidden themselves amongst the nations and they're not so oppressed. So even look in our modern day how God has started with our brother Judah who was oppressed and afflicted the most and he freed them first. We can even see that uh, throughout history. God always starting with the most troubled first and working in reverse. Then the second and third promise is I will deliver you and redeem you because he's redeeming us from the slavery that we are in. But first he takes away our oppression. Then the promise to reverse us being in a land that is not ours, he says, I will bring you back to the land and I will give it to you. And then to heal the estrangement from God, look at this beautiful, intimate language. He says, I'm going to take you for my people. You'll no longer be estranged from me and I will be your God. So this is something new that the Father downloaded to me just this year that I didn't even see last year, this beautiful reversal of the prophecy that he gave to Abraham. And we're going to go through each one of these elements and see hidden glimpses of Yeshua as our Savior, the implement of God's salvation. In the first cup, he says, I will free you. In Exodus 6, 6, he says, Therefore says to the sons of Israel, I am Yahavah. He's revealing himself as this self-existent father of love when he's coming in his salvation to free us from the burdens of the Egyptians. And this reminds me of Psalms 4, verse 3, which says, But know this, Yahavah hath set apart the godly for himself. Messiah frees us from the bondage of sin and calls us out of spiritual Egypt. Even before he comes and reigns as Messiah, and before he regathers the exiles back to the land, there was a work to be done in freeing us from the transgression of the Torah, breaking the Torah, and, and promises to give us rest from the mental, spiritual, and emotional burdens of life that come as the byproduct of sin. And in so doing, he gives us the peace of God which passes all understanding and keeps our hearts and minds in him, Philippians says. 2 Corinthians 7.1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us be free. So here it's correlating the promises and the first promise, which is freedom, from all filthiness of the flesh. Ultimately, this is what Yeshua was freeing us from. Many people misunderstand his sacrifice and they say, oh, he did it all at the cross. So you can continue sinning and you can throw away Torah and he did it all for you. But that's not what it's saying. Look at what Rabbi Shaul is saying. He's freeing us from having to be slaves to sin. Now we can be overcomers. We don't have to be uh, enslaved to the filthiness of a fleshy mind or spirit. We are now free to perfect holiness in the fear of God. And what is fear? In the Hebrew understanding, a holy awe, a very uh, intimate uh, awe of God. Revelation 18, 4, God calls us out of this false system of Babylon so that we will not participate of her sins any longer and that we will not receive of her plagues. And this is what God is doing to Israel. He's calling Israel out from Egypt so that she will not experience the plagues. So Babylon and Egypt are almost synonymous. The only difference is Egypt represents the whole world and Babylon represents the false system of governance and religion that permeates the whole world. But we're to come out of all of that. This second promise, which we drink the second cup at Pesach, is the cup of deliverance. He says, I will deliver them from their bondage. 
The Egyptians were powerful, and the Israelites did not have it within their power to break the shackles without God's help. Just like us, we don't have the power to break the shackles of sin, slavery to sin, without God's help. Just as God promised to deliver Israel from the Egyptian bondage, and just as Israel could not save themselves, God promises to deliver us from our enslavement to sin. God is able to deliver us from the domain of darkness, as it says in Colossians 1.13. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has carried us away into the kingdom of his dear son? This Dabar, this word made flesh. Second Peter says, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. So we can think of this promise of deliverance from even delivering us from succumbing to temptation. We know God tempts no man. He'll allow men to be tested, but that's only for our character development to be revealed. But he never tempts, and he will deliver us from temptation. The third promise hints at our redemption. He says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Yeshua, when he ascended to heaven, where did he sit? At the right hand of God. We talked about Binyamin's name representing Yeshua. So this outstretched arm is his righteous right hand, which is ready to redeem. And it always is a connotation of God's implement of redemption through Yeshua. He says, I'm going to redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And we're going to see this not only in Egypt, but in our day. In the time of tribulation, there's going to be great judgments and plagues that fall upon the earth and that wake people up to repentance. It's actually merciful. But do they repent? Most of the world, it's prophesied, will not repent. They will curse God for the plagues, just the way Pharaoh hardened his heart and cursed God. To redeem something or someone is to buy them back. This hints also at the sacrifice of Yeshua. We think of Yeshua and the spiritual redemption God made possible through him. It is by his power, through his sacrifice, that we are redeemed from our sins. Romans 5, 6 says this. Ephesians 1, 7 says this. It is by his stripes that we are healed in Isaiah 53. And Rabbi Shaul reminds us that we are not our own any longer because we have been bought with a price. So here we were slaves, and it's as if God has redeemed us so that we could be betrothed at Sinai. And then we became slaves to sin, and so Yeshua redeemed us. He paid the price for us. And so we are no longer our own. We need to be a slave to righteousness now instead of unrighteousness and a servant to the Most High God. So all of these ancient promises given to Moshe to deliver to the people were not only for their time, but for the coming uh, salvation of the world. So many hinted symbols. The fourth promise is this fourth cup that Yeshua did not take of, which looks forward to the marriage of the Lamb. He says, I will take you for my people. God loved the people of Israel. He nurtured them and protected them. These were God's own people, his own possession. As his people, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. When you share this identity with somebody, imagine how, one, it sets them free to realize that they've been cleansed and delivered from sin. Once you've been cleansed, you don't want to go out and get muddied up again. So this inspires us to be overcomers. But then to realize that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, we need to live like a royal priesthood. We need to live as God's own possession, holy and pure, as a bride without spot or blemish. It's time to live our lives with the confidence fitting those who praise the one and only true God as our eternal Father. Now, in this fifth promise, or the fourth, still part of the fourth cup, he says, and I will be your God, we also call this cup the cup of Elijah. Because the spirit of Elijah is always prophesied to come before the day of the Lord. And... It says, there had been many gods in Egypt, but there is only one true God. Each one of the plagues was dealing with 
a different plague that the Egyptians worshipped. There is greed and selfishness and pride in our lives that are idols. But still, there's only one true God. So we can see how he allowed these things to wake up the people to realize that what the Egyptians were worshiping was not lasting, it was not real, had no power. And the same way with us. It might not be frogs and, and uh, cattle that we worship today, but we have our own idols in our life. The... Uh, Ten plagues, I'd like you to, to go through with me and to look at how each one of these addressed a different Egyptian god. Yes, So Jeff. I have a list that I did a study a few years ago. So I have a list of each one of these plagues and which gods they were and what they were representing and also what that means to us. If you want me to read, it's like one paragraph for each one as you go through them. It's up to you. Yeah, let's do that. So we'll start with the waters. And the Egyptians worshipped the Nile River. It was the source of all their life, and especially the time when it would flood and water all of the crops. And they called the god of the Nile Nu. They also had a god which was called the guardian of the source of springs, or the river's source. And that was Hanum. And then they had Hapi, who was the spirit of the Nile. So they actually had three deities associated with this water. That was the reason why God made the waters the very first thing that he showed that their gods had no power over by turning them to blood. Do you want to read about the first? So the Nile was viewed as the provider for everything, wealth and provision for every living thing, plant, animal, and human. They worshipped the Nile River as a god, as the giver of life. It provided water to drink, food from fish, transportation, and flooding for their crops. The Egyptians moved and manipulated the water, their god, to their own purposes and usage. We try to be our own gods, manipulating the things around us to make our world what we want it to be. We reject our need for the one true God in our lives. We come to God and try to manipulate him in his words so we can get our way. Where is your dependence? Very good. And I'm glad that you're bringing these out in correlation with each one of these gods because after we look at these ten different gods of the Egyptians uh, in the ten different plagues, we're going to look at some modern day idols in our own life. And one of those idols, they all deal with self because we know all sin is some type of self. And control and manipulation, as you just mentioned there, is one of those that we will look at. So this fits perfectly. Thank you, Jeff. The second plague dealt with Het, who was a goddess of fertility, with the head of the frog in Egyptian hieroglyphics. And so this is why frogs um, multiplied across the land, so much so that there was no place that they could step without stepping on the frogs. Frogs are worshipped as a god of fertility. Look at all the pagan societies and the predominance of sexual immorality that has been so pervasive. Look at our own society and the world and how much this dominates the internet, magazines, video, TV, and on and on. Our society is plagued by abortion and many other sins associated with this kind of sin. Very good. These are the thing that you did first with the four steps and uh -huh. reversing, I was going, wow, wait a minute, this just really ties in with our deliverance. It totally. Step our and we have to make it, ap yes, apply to us today. It's not just about some past God. And it's so perfect the way that the Ruach uh, always develops these things, bringing it more home to today. The third God was addressed in the third plague, and his name was Seb. And Seb was an earth god. And so these gnats and lice that would multiply in the dust um, was dealing with the earth god who couldn't do away with them. So this was the god of the earth. <laughs> Egyptian priests washed themselves for cleanliness twice in the day and twice in the evening. They shaved themselves to clean themselves to serve their gods. A lot of this, a lot of this was about outward appearance and they were special with special clothes housing privileges etc and there were thousands of these priests in egypt we sometimes fall into the same trap we get carnal and earthly minded and worry more about what's on the outward our wealth education how we appear rather than the heart these are good meditations 
The fourth plague dealt with Uatkit, which was a fly god of Egypt. The god of Amun-Ra was the main god depicted in this plague. He was thought of as the great god of the creator. He was depicted as the sun and also as a beetle, as well as other types of creatures. Most of this worship was of the sun and its abilities along with other, all other creatures pictured in our solar constellation. One is a beetle that pushed the sun around the sky. Others were the scorpion, crab, and snake, and more. These were biting beasts. The Egyptians had a real fascination with the stars and following the worship of stars, zodiac signs, horoscopes, and such. We have similar issues in our society as well. Worship of the earth, worship. Uh, we have astrology, movies, Harry Potter, and others, star, sun, and moon worship. Very good. Now, I might mention to some of our <coughs> online video watchers that the Torah tells us not to utter the name of a false god in the sense of worship or any kind of praise or any kind of regular common language, not to become common with these things. But in the case of teaching, it's okay to make the people know um, who these false gods were and how God was addressing each one of them. And so this is one of the rare cases where it's allowed to use the names of these false gods is uh, for the teaching purpose. The fifth plague was the bull god, Apis. And it was a cow head. And also there was a goddess. A lot of times you have the male and female de deity, just like that's why you see the crescent moon and the star. Um, Apis and Hathor. Hathor was the goddess of the desert uh, where it was conveyed by a cow head as well. Cattle and animals were worshipped in many different ways. One of the main was the bull Apis. They thought this animal had the powers of prophecy to look into the future. Yeshua came against this kind of thinking and told his apostles they had a job to do now. Rather than looking, trying to figure out what was going to happen, go out and do what you're supposed to now, rather than trying to figure out the future. That's right. We are not con to consult soothsayers, sorcerers, necromancers, um, those that conjure up spirits of any sort, we are to only pray and consult the one true God. And they would use Apis for this purpose of divination. The sixth plague, since we don't have any room down here, but I have a little depiction of it with the boils, is addressing Thoth. And Thoth was the god of medical learning. And because the people got boils, this addressed that he couldn't take away the boils. And this is actually the very first plague that we're going to see in the last days upon those who have the mark of the beast. It says everyone who has the mark of the beast will have boils. It's interesting that boils begins the plagues in the last days and the seventh plague uh, is the final plague, the f plague of hail. And the hail in the last days, the seventh plague, is the one plague that the saints will not have to endure because Yeshua comes back at the end of the sixth plague, which is Armageddon, and delivers us. This plague is also synonymous with the fall of Babylon, that seventh plague time. It's a hundred pound hail, fire, um, earthquakes that decimates all of the cities of the earth which are promoting the false system of Babylon across the world. So you can see some correlation with why this Torah portion is ended here with hail, uh, because that's where it ends in the last days. Let's see if I... And then there was a second god that dealt with um, epidemics, and her name, it was a goddess, Sekhmet. Do you want to share about the sixth plague? So this was against the gods of medicine and healing and knowledge. Serapis and Imhotep, there's multiple gods in That's right. each one of these. They worship not only the gods to heal them, but also to prolong life, both here and in the afterlife. It is also about life right now. The ashes were from the altar, so Moses was commanded to throw up ashes. So the ashes were a representation of the altars that they used to sacrifice their children to the gods. And he threw these ashes up in the ground. Yeshua showed us that he is a true healer. The magicians in Egypt 
would have had been the ones offering the sacrifices of their children and they were hit the hardest with the inability to stand or to offer their hideous sacrifices. We seek the same knowledge for, uh, in surgeries to have the perfect body, long life. We aren't happy unless we're perfect in every way. And we've even taken the abortion clinic and taken fetal tissue and basically done the same thing to extend our lives. That's right. Once again, self-focus. The seventh plague was addressing Het, wife of the Creator. This came against the god Isis and Set who were to protect the crops and land against what came from the skies. This is also against the sky gods, which were also to protect and provide what was needed when it was needed. The word thunder in verse 23 is the Hebrew word kol, which means voice. <clears throat> yes. You want to hear his voice, but not really listen to it. He is the one that's the ultimate protector of us. And the eighth one plague was locusts, addressing Serapiet, protector from locusts. All the gods that were to protect the food in all their sources were silenced by this plague. The land's comfort and wealth and food and riches were under attack. The selfishness of the people and their arrogance and their own richness and provision. Remember that in the start of this whole thing, the Pharaoh who came into power, feared that the Israelites would leave and their lifestyle would suffer. The ninth plague was darkness, which addressed Ra, the god of the sun. Also, they had gods Aten, Horus, Tim, and Shu that this addressed. Horus was the god of light in Egypt. He was thought of as the creator god and the one that provided life in all its forms, the life-giving force of the sun. He was the one thought of as the all-powerful and the one in control. It is interesting to note that this darkness was thick. This is actually translated, there was a dark darkness in all the land. This is also used in Deuteronomy 28 and 29 about what would happen to Israel if they disobeyed the commandments and covenant of God. This darkness is also a representation of something that could be felt as in fear or other emotions. It was a sense of dread. In total darkness, when you can't see your hand or anything else, your other senses become enhanced and fear becomes stronger. It is said at this plague that it was at this time that the Egyptians actually went to the different households that they could see. Darkness was only upon the Egyptians and that the Israelites would go and ask their Egyptian neighbors, do you have any gold or silver that we can uh, take with us as we go out? And they couldn't see anything, so it was as if they didn't even have it. They said, take whatever you can find. They couldn't see anything. Like he said, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And so they could go through and literally plunder the Egyptians and see clearly and they were glad to give it to them because they couldn't even conceive of what they had there. We in our times have other things that we have raised to the point of worship like Mother Earth, climate control and other elements of the earth and sky. It's not that we don't want to take care of things and be good stewards but we aren't to raise to the point of worship but there is one who is the creator. He is our light in times of darkness. He is the one we should call upon. Amen. And the tenth and final plague is the death of the firstborn. And this addressed Pharaoh himself, who was considered to be a son of God. He considered himself the son of Ra. And so this is why they worshiped the Pharaoh. And so it was addressing him, putting himself as the son of God instead of the true son of God. He had killed children of Israel also, and now he couldn't protect his own son. This plague, as one commenter said, is directed at all the gods of Egypt. And, but the most powerful was considered Pharaoh, yes. the supreme god over Egypt. It would show the inability of their gods to have any power whatsoever against the power of the one true God, Yahweh. There were multiple gods that were to protect the children, and specifically Pharaoh and his children. The god of fertility, procreation, protection at birth, the guardian of life, the nursing gods, etc. For us, it is the sin that is in our lives for all the things we have done to be in control of our own destiny and life. The desire to live forever, our failure to recognize the one who is in complete control of all things. He has delivered us from the eternal damnation by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Thank you for that. That adds beautifully because now we're going to sum up 
some of these areas in our own life, all relating to different aspects of self. Yeshua said in John 4, 23, The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. So what are the idols and false gods that we put our trust in today? We know that sin is the transgression of the Torah. And if the Torah is a transcript of God's very nature, which He has revealed to us as Yahweh, the self-existent Father of selfless love, then ultimately, all sin is any area of our life that is not selfless in nature, but is self-seeking or self-focused, selfish, self-exalting. And so, all of these things that Jeff and I uh, have summed up in the Ten Plagues can be summed up as all forms of self-seeking or selfishness. There's different areas where we try to control the situation. We manipulate one another. We coerce. We use power wrongly. God gave us dominion to take care of one another and to take care of the earth. All forms of power and control and manipulation are different forms of self-exaltation. Now remember, all elements of self lead to self-destruction. It's selfless love that leads to eternal life. And this is why we keep encouraging people to remember who they truly are as cr created children in the image of God because it is through our true identity that we will have our destiny in eternal life instead of thinking that this is all about whatever I can do for myself and then that ultimately destroys us in life and we miss out on the great blessings that God intended for us. A third one that I thought of is the different types of self-adornment that we put upon ourselves. Too much focus on the, the beauty or the self for the wrong purpose without glory to God the way He's naturally created us is another form of idol in our life. And we see that in the media, don't we? The beauty and the models and the uh, sexualization of every product out there. How do they sell products but make it look like it's going to bring you a beautiful woman or it's going to make you look that much better? And poor girls have such a false identity in trying to keep up with the marketing of the media and advertising world. Another aspect is the, the love of money, mammon, wealth, greed. Money is not a sin. Money is a tool to be used for good. But the love of money, where we make it an idol in our life, this is a type of self-sufficiency. We think that it's going to save us from whatever is down the road. Hey, we can buy our way out of it. That's another type of idol in our life that we have to meditate on. And the reason I mention all of these is because all of us are coming from different places, but one of these might spark something in your own life or somebody that's watching the video and they might say, aha, I didn't realize that before, but yes, I need to let God take that from my life and it can be a blessing. It's not to ever point the finger or to have any judgment because we've all experienced different elements of these different types of idols in our life. Another one the Father revealed to me is pharmakia, which is likened to witchcraft. The, the word is actually the origin of uh, witchcraft in the Greek. And it's a type of self-magic. And it doesn't really heal the way God gave healing in, through prayer and through fasting and through herbal medicines. Pharmakia is like magic because it just covers up the um, symptoms. So you think that you're well, but the root problem is still there, that imbalance or that sin or that poison in your life. And so it's another element of self that's an idol. And sometimes we rely on medicine, as we were talking this morning, or on our medical insurance or on our pharmaceutical drugs. And we want to slowly wean ourselves off of that and return to a natural Eden diet that will be self-healing the way God created it to be. The sixth and final uh, type of idol self-focus is even substituting the day that God gave to us as a covenant to rest and to be free, truly free, as His children, to do away with the seventh-day Shabbat and to substitute it with a day that represents homage to the Son God, Ra, is a type of self-worship. A day for self rather than a day for God. You know, any other day is a day of work, right? You can do whatever you need to do on that day. 
Shabbat, you don't do any work. So if you create a day where you can do whatever you want, you can feast, you can party, you can um, worship however or whatever you want to worship, then ultimately this is taking the focus off of the one true God, and that's called idol worship. So just a little meditation to bring it home to us today. The sixth promise, which is what I call the fifth cup, which most Jews do not partake of the fifth cup, and sometimes we do in our seders just to look forward to, because we believe we're the final generation, and we look forward to being returned to the land. Uh, so it's kind of fun to introduce this fifth cup as the inheritance cup, the cup of promise to return us to the land, which God swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was a long journey Israel had to make through the wilderness to get to the land of promise. It is certain that the nation could not survive the journey at all without the providence of God. What Israel had to do was to respect and trust in God. They had to do the marching. They had to move at God's command. The New Testament places us in the wilderness experience today. We are not at home in this world, but we live by faith that we are marching towards that promised land when Mashiach comes. Though the journey sometimes seems filled with peril, we're confident because we know that God is with us. But like Israel of old, we must be willing to put one foot in front of the other towards that goal of being overcomers and victorious over sin. We must move at God's command. The seventh and final promise is linked in with this inheritance. He says, I will give you the land as your inheritance. I am Yahavah. The journey through difficult time, though difficult at times, would not last forever. The goal was the promised land of Israel. The land described as flowing with milk and honey, which had been promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This land was to be the inheritance of Abraham's descendants. Though we are on a journey that is difficult at times, we understand that we have that same inheritance waiting for us. Plus, after the thousand years of peace in the Messianic age and kingdom, we will look forward to the new Jerusalem, an eternal paradise with streets of gold, with God at its center, and an uncorruptible crown of life as tre our treasure. This will be our eternal home. There is no place like it. Let us never be fooled into abandoning the journey that we must take to reach it. All of these are little parallels of these promises that were given to Israel back in Egypt. So, let's read on. Moshe told the people these promises, but they wouldn't listen to him because they were so discouraged and their slavery was so cruel. Adonai said to Moshe, Go in and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel leave his land. Moshe said to Adonai, Look, the people of Israel haven't listened to me, so how will Pharaoh listen to me, poor speaker that I am? But Adonai spoke to Moshe and Aaron and gave them orders concerning both the people of Israel and Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Now these were the heads of their families. The son of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, were Hanok, Palu, Hetzron, and Carmi. These were the families of Reuben. The sons of Shimon were Yemuel, Yamin, Ohad, Yakin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. These were the families of Shimon. These are the names of the sons of Levi with their descendants, Gershon, Chot, and Merari. Levi lived to be 137 years old. The sons of Gershon were Livni and Shimi with their families. And the sons of Kahat were Amram, who was Aaron and Moses' father, Yitzhar, Hevron, and Mushi, or, and Uziel. Kahat lived to be 133 years old. And the sons of Merari were Makli and Mushi. These were the families of Levi with their descendants. Now Amram married a woman named Yachaved, his father's sister. So this is like a aunt. And she bore him Aaron and Moshe. Amram lived to be 137 years old. The sons of Yitzhar were Korach, Nepheg, Zikri, and the sons of Uziel were Mishael, Ephsaphan and Zitri. Aaron married Elisheva, daughter of Amminadav. 
the daughter of Nakshon, and she bore him Nadav, Avihu, Eleazar, and Itamar. The sons of Korach, now remember that these four sons of Aaron, Nadav, Avihu, Elazar, and Itamar, were where the priests came from. To be a priest, you had to be a Levite, but not all Levites were priests. To be a priest, you had to be specifically a son of Aaron. So we know, remember the story of Nadav and Avihu who died by bringing strange fire into the temple. So ultimately, Aaron passed on the high priestly mantle to Eliezer. This, verse 24 says, The sons of Korach were Ashir, Elkanah, and Avi Asav. These were the Chorki families. And Elazar, who was the future priest, the son of Aaron, married one of the daughters of Putiel. Now remember a few weeks ago where I gave you different names of Yitro? Putiel is one of those names. So just like Moshe married a daughter of Yitro, here we find that Aaron's son also married one of the daughters of Yitro. And she bore him Pincus, who was a righteous man. These were the heads of the families of Levi, family by family. And this, as so many names are, has a different connotation of Yitro's character. Putiel means friend or associate of God. And here, he's grafted into the family of Israel, not only himself, but through the marriage of his daughters to the family of Levi. These are the Aaron and Moshe to whom Adonai said, bring the people out of the land of Egypt, division by division, and who told Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel leave Egypt. These are the same Moshe and Aharon. On the day when Adonai spoke to Moshe in the land of Egypt, he said, I am Yahavah. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I say to you. Moshe answered Adonai, Look, I'm such a poor speaker that Pharaoh won't listen to me. But was this correct? Was Moshe saying this because he's humble or because he was insecure? Acts, if you look at Acts chapter 7, verse 22, Luke, who writes the Chronicles of Yeshua, actually refers back to this, and he says, It was then that uh, Moshe was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight. For three months he was reared in his father's house, and when he was put out of his home, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own. So Moshe was trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and became both a powerful speaker and a man of action. <laughs> Interesting that they correlate this or they relate this through the oral Torah that's been passed down. He had every manner of knowledge in astronomy and in crystals and in martial arts and in um, all the uh, writings of the known world at that time. There was much wisdom literature that was hidden amongst um, different areas of the world. And Moshe not only grew up with wisdom, but with powerful speech, knowing how to use words powerfully. So maybe that's the connotation of that he was a good speaker. I don't know if it was because he was eloquent or if he, just because when he spoke, I mean, it manifested with power. He really knew how to use his words properly. So, let's see, where did we leave? Oh, now we're in chapter 7, which introduces the first plague. But Adonai said to Moshe, I have put you in the place of God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, will be your prophet. Just like Yeshua speaks God's word on God's behalf, and Yochanan speaks to King Herod, we see Moses being a type of God to Pharaoh. He says, I've put you in the place of God, and Aaron, your brother, will be your prophet. And in Yeshua's first coming, he was recognized as a prophet. He didn't fulfill being Mashiach until he sets up his kingdom and returns the exiles and rebuilds the temple. So this is why most do not call him Mashiach yet. He is a, truly a prophet, and even the Quran relates to him as a prophet. And so does um, here, there's a little allusion to that as Aaron 
is going to be your prophet as Yeshua was God's prophet. You are to say everything I ordered you to say. And Aaron, your brother, is to speak to Pharaoh and tell him to let the people of Israel leave his land. But I will make him hard-hearted. Even though I will increase my signs and wonders in the land, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Now, there's two words for hard-hearted. And what God was doing was strengthening Pharaoh to endure what was to come. Pharaoh was making his own heart hard-hardened. And there's two different Hebrew words that connotate this behind the scenes. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies, my people, the son of Israel, out of the land of Egypt with great acts of judgment. Then when I stretch out my hand over Egypt and bring the people of Israel out from among them, the Egyptians will know that I am Yahava. So first he says, listen, I was known by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai. I want to introduce myself to you as Yahava so that you can introduce me to Israel as Yahava. Then here it says that after he stretches out his hand, this act of deliverance, this act of saving power, and he brings Israel out from amongst them, the Egyptians will know who Yahava is. Moshe and Aaron did exactly what Adonai had ordered them to do. Moshe was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. Adonai said to Moshe and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, tell Aaron to take his staff and throw it down in front of Pharaoh so that it can become a snake. Moshe and Aaron went into Pharaoh and did this, as Adonai had ordered. Aharon threw down his staff in front of Pharaoh and his servants, and it turned into a snake. But Pharaoh, in turn, called for the sages and sorcerers, and they too, the magicians of Egypt, did the same thing, making use of their secret occultic arts. Each one threw his staff down, and they turned into snakes. But Arun's sta staff swallowed up theirs. Nevertheless, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he didn't listen to them, as Adonai said would happen. Adonai said to Moshe, Pharaoh is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning when he goes out to the water. Stand on the riverbank to confront him. Take in your hand the staff which was turned into a snake and say to him, Yahavah, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they can worship me in the desert. But until now you have not listened. So Adonai says, This will let you know that I am yod heh vav -Heh. I will take the staff in my hand and strike the water in the river, and it will be turned into blood. The fish in the river will die. The river will stink, and the Egyptians won't want to drink water or bathe in it anymore. Adonai said to Moshe, Say to Aaron, Take your staff, reach out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, canals, ponds, and the reservoirs, so that they can turn into blood. There will be blood throughout the whole land of Egypt, even in the wooden buckets and stone jars that they had used to collect water for drinking. Moshe and Aaron did exactly what Adonai had ordered. He raised his staff and in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants struck the water in the river, and all the water in the river was turned into blood. The fish in the river died, and the river stank so badly that the Egyptians couldn't drink its water. And there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Wherever there was a little pocket of water or water collected for drinking or for bathing, it turned to blood also. But the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret art, so that Pharaoh was made hard-hardened and didn't listen to them. As Adonai said would happen, Pharaoh just turned and went back to his place. Now, of course, they didn't make the whole land filled with blood like God did, because what they would have done is brought a little bit of water and showed how they could mix something in with it and turned it blood. The whole land was already turned to blood. All the Egyptians dug around the river for clean water to drink because they couldn't drink the river water. Seven days after Adonai had struck the river, Adonai said to Moshe, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Here is what Adonai says, Let my people go so that they can worship me. And this is very similar to that call that we looked at in Revelation 18.4. Come out of her, my people. Come out of Babylon so that you participate not in her sins and receive not of her plagues. God is calling us out today to true worship, 
out of the false Babylonian system of false worship. He goes on, verse 27, or in your Bible it might be chapter 8, verse 2. If you refuse to let them go, I will strike all your territory with frogs. The river will swarm with frogs. They will go up, enter your palace and your bedrooms, onto your bed. And they will enter the houses of your servants and your people, and will go into your ovens and even your kneading bowls. The frogs will climb all over you and your people and your servants. Adonai said to Moshe, Say to Aaron, Reach out your hand with your staff over the rivers, canals, and ponds, and cause frogs to come up onto the land of Egypt. So Aaron put out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. This is the second plague. But the magicians did the same with their secret arts and brought up frogs onto the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh summoned Moshe and Aaron and said, Intercede with Yahavah to take the frogs away from me and my people, and I will let the people go and sacrifice to Yahavah. Moshe said to Pharaoh, Not only that, but you can have the honor of naming the time when I will pray for you, your servants and your people, to be rid of the frogs, both yourselves and your homes, and that they stay only in the river. So Pharaoh answered, Tomorrow. Moshe said, It will be as you have said. And from this you will learn that Yahavah, our God, has no equal. The frogs will leave you in your homes, also your servants and your people. They will stay in the river only. Moshe and Aaron left Pharaoh's presence, and Moshe cried out to Yahavah about the frogs he had brought on Pharaoh. Yahavah did as Moshe had asked. The frogs died in the houses and the courtyards and the fields, and they gathered them by the heap loads till the land stank with dead frogs. When Pharaoh saw that he had been given some relief, guess what? He got his he stub he made his heart stubborn again. Yes, Jeff. This is the only plague, the only time that Pharaoh didn't want to let go because of the God that was associated with this. The only time he said the next day. Yeah. He was so hung up on this God that he did not want to, even though the frogs were an intrusion, mm -hmm. it was coming against that God and he was so hung up, he did not want to create harm. That's, That's a very good point. Place where he said the next day. To wait, yeah. And here is a good, clear clarification that he made himself hard-hearted. It's not God who destines anybody to be lost or hardens anybody's heart. God was strengthening him to endure through this, to reveal himself to Pharaoh. But Pharaoh made his own heart hard-hearted, and he would not listen to them just as Adonai said would happen. Adonai said to Moshe, Say to Aaron, Reach out with your staff and strike the dust on the ground. It will become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. They did it. Aaron reached out his hand and with his staff struck the dust on the ground. And there were lice on people and animals. All the dust on the ground became lice throughout the whole land of Egypt. The magicians tried with their secret arts to produce lice, but they could not. There were lice on people, and there was lice on animals. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh made his heart hard again, so that he didn't listen to them, just as Adonai said would happen. Adonai said to Moshe, Get up early in the morning, stand before Pharaoh when he goes out to the water, and say to him, Here is what Adonai says, Let my people go, so that they can worship me. Otherwise, if you won't let my people go, I will send the fourth plague, swarms of insects upon you and your servants and your people into your homes. The houses of the Egyptians will be full of swarms of insects and likewise the ground they stand on. But I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people will live. No swarms of insects will be there. So you can realize that I am Adonai. And this we could correlate to us today if we leave the Babylonian system, if we go out by faith and live outside of the city centers like they did in Goshen, then when the plagues come, God can protect his people who have listened with spiritual ears to his calling far in advance to come out of this system. Notice in Goshen, no swarms of insects came upon the land where the Israelites were living. Yes, he says, I will distinguish between myself and your people. And this sign will happen by tomorrow. 
Adonai did it. Terrible swarms of insects went into Pharaoh's place and into all his servants' houses. The insects ruined the entire land of Egypt. Pharaoh summoned Moshe and Aaron and said, Go and sacrifice to your God, but here in the land. <laughs> He's always trying to manipulate the situation or still control it. But Moshe replied, It would be inappropriate for us to do that because the animal we sacrifice to Adonai, our God, is an abomination to the Egyptians. Won't the Egyptians stone us to death if before their very eyes we sacrifice what they consider an abomination? No, we will go three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice to Adonai, our God, as he has ordered us to do. Pharaoh said, I will let you go so that you can sacrifice to Adonai, your God, in the desert. Anytime that I'm saying Adonai, this is the yod heh vav -Hey. We're just putting Adonai in so that we don't say the holy name um, too much. But you can know that he's, they're actually relating back and forth to this holy name that God has revealed himself as, both Pharaoh and Moses. Only, he says, when you go, you are not to go very far away. And I want you to intercede on my behalf. Moshe said, all right, I am going away from you, and I will intercede with Adonai so that tomorrow the swarms of insects will leave Pharaoh, his servants, and his people. Just make sure that Pharaoh stops playing games with the people by preventing them from going and sacrificing to Adonai. Moshe left Pharaoh and interceded with Adonai, and Adonai did what Moshe had asked. He removed the swarms of insects from Pharaoh, his servants, and his people. Not one remained, but this time, too, Pharaoh made himself stubborn and did not let the people of Israel go. Then, chapter 9, verse 1, Adonai said to Moshe, Go to Pharaoh and tell him, Here is what Adonai, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go so that they can worship me. If you refuse to let them go and persist in holding on to them, the hand of Adonai is on your livestock in the field and on the horses and the donkeys and the camels and the cattle and the flocks and will make them suffer a devastating illness. But Adonai, this is what we call pestilence. And you know, there's four judgments that come upon the land at the beginning of the time of trouble that kill 25% of the people. And that is war, famine, disease, which is likened to pestilence, both of humans and uh, animals, and beasts. And so we see this constant correlation back and forth with what will happen in the last days. He says, but Adonai will distinguish between Egypt's livestock and Israel's livestock. Nothing belonging to the people of Israel will die. Adonai determined the exact time by saying, tomorrow Adonai will do this in the land. The following day, Adonai did it. All the livestock of Egypt died, but not one of the animals belonging to the people of Israel died. Pharaoh investigated and found that not even one of the animals of the people of Israel had died. Nevertheless, Pharaoh's heart remained stubborn, and he didn't let the people go. This is very indicative of the people in the state of mind in the last days. Plague after plague, it says, they hardened their heart, they cursed God, but they would not repent. That's in Revelation chapter 16. Adonai said to Moshe and Aaron, Take handfuls of ashes from a kiln and let Moshe throw them into the air before Pharaoh's eyes. They will turn into fine dust over the land of Egypt and become infected sores on men and animals throughout Egypt. So they took ashes from a kiln, stood in front of Pharaoh, and threw them in the air, and they became infected sores on men and animals. And like Jeff said, this may have very well been the kilns from the god of Molech, which they sacrificed children to. And so here this is coming back as boils on their body. Now, here's the sixth plague that we're at. Boils. And this is what starts the plagues in the last days and identifies those with the mark of the beast. Boils. And here's hail next, the seventh and, and last one in this Torah portion, and the last one in the last days, even though in the Egyptian experience, because of Pharaoh's hardness of heart, it went on to ten plagues. 
The magicians couldn't even stand in Moses' presence because of the sores, which were on them as well as on other Egyptians. But Adonai made Pharaoh hard-hearted so that he didn't listen to them, just as Adonai had said to Moshe. Adonai said to Moshe, Get up early in the morning, stand before Pharaoh, and say to him, Here is what Adonai says, Let my people go, so that they can worship me. For this time I will inflict my plagues on you, yourself, and on your officials, and on your people, so that you will realize that I am without equal in all the earth. Do you know, even though in the Torah it relates to God bringing these plagues, with the character of God, we know God is a life giver. He's not a life taker. And David, in Psalms chapter 78, reiterates the whole plague experience, and he says clearly it was a band of destroying angels doing this destructive work. And we know that Hasatan and his band of fallen angels seek to steal, kill, and destroy. So we always like to clarify the character of God from that which, when you remove yourself from the protection of God, it's a domain of death that Hasatan is ready to inflict, like he did with uh, Job, um, wounds, you know, uh, sores, um, sickness, uh, ultimately death. So we always like to clarify the difference because I, the prophet Isaiah says, Woe to him who calls good evil. So we never want to attribute an evil attribute onto the Father's character. Even though in this time, they did not know about Hasatan and the fallen angels and what was happening behind the scenes. So they attributed everything, light and darkness, good and evil, to God. The first mention of Hasatan that we see in Scripture is actually by King David around 1000 B.C. and then later by Ezra when he rewrites the stories of Samuel and uh, Job and introduces this character of Hasatan in there. So for the first 3,000 years, everything's going to be written, attributed to God. He says, It is for this very reason I have kept you alive, to show you my power, so that my name may resound throughout the whole earth. And everyone heard around the whole earth what God had done to deliver the Israelites against Pharaoh's wishes. This message went out. This is why the nations were afraid of Israel when they were traveling through the wilderness. Since you are still setting yourself up against my people and not letting them go, tomorrow about this time I will cause a hailstorm so heavy that Egypt has had nothing like it from the day it was founded until now. Therefore send and hurry to bring indoors all your livestock and everything else you have in the field. For hail will fall on every human being and animal left in the field that hasn't been brought home, and they will die. And this is ultimately what happens when Yeshua gathers up the saints. It says, The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain are caught up with them. This is at the end of the sixth plague in the last days. Then, without the holy ones on this earth, the seventh plague uh, opens up 100-pound hail that falls upon man and beast and upon buildings and decimates the whole surface of the earth. And this is why when the saints come back, on Sukkot with the Lord, what do they find according to Ezekiel? But bones scattering the surface of the earth. Bones that the flesh has been picked clean by vultures during that time period where we were experiencing the uh, feast, the marriage feast in the heavenly sphere. The vultures and birds of prey were experiencing a feast on this earth. This is all correlating to the seventh plague in the last days, the fall of Babylon, which occurs over 15 days. It's a symbolic one hour in Revelation. And it says that... Whoever among Pharaoh's servants feared what Adonai had said had his slaves and his livestock escape into the houses. But those who had no regard for what Adonai had said left their slaves and their livestock in the field. Adonai said to Moshe, Reach out your hand toward the sky so that there will be hail in all the land of Egypt, falling on the people, animals, and everything growing in the field throughout the land of Egypt. Moshe reached out with his staff toward the sky, and Adonai sent thunder and hail, and fire ran down to the earth. And this is an apt description of exactly what happens uh, in the last days. Thunder and hail and earthquake and fire. 
And Adonai caused it to hail on the land of Egypt. It hailed, and fire flashed up with the hail. It was terrible, worse than any hailstorm in all of Egypt since it became a nation. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the hail struck everything in the field, people and animals, and the hail struck every plant growing in the field and broke every tree. But in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, there was no hail. This is an encouraging word to know that no matter what is going to happen in the last days, God is going to have his protective hand over his people. This is a type for the anti-type. Pharaoh summoned Moshe and Aaron and said to them, This time I have sinned. Adonai is in the right. I and my people are in the wrong. Intercede with Adonai. We can't take any more of this terrible... And it, when it says thunder, it actually is this word coal that you mentioned earlier. It's like the voices. Even the Israelites at the base of Mount Sinai, when they heard the voice of God, if their heart wasn't in the right place, they didn't understand what he was saying. And it sounded like thunder scary thunder so much so that they said Moses tell the father not to speak to us any longer for him to just speak to you and whatever he says to you we will trust what you say you speak to us well this is what Pharaoh is hearing this is more than thunder this is like loud voices and sounds and hail and he says and I will let you go and you will stay no longer Moshe said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands to Adonai. The thunder will end, and there won't be any more hail, so that you can know that the earth belongs to yod heh vav -Heh. But you and your servants, I know, you still won't fear Adonai as God. The flax and the barley were ruined. So what time of year does this tell you this was? This is springtime, the Aviv. Yes, when the barley is green in the ear. Because the barley was ripe. This, is, this word ripe here is where we get our name for the month, Aviv. The barley was in the state of Aviv, which means green in the ear. And the flax in the bud. But the wheat and the buckwheat, which comes 50 days later, that's harvested during the Feast of Shavuot, they're still in their infancy like grass, green grass. So they weren't ruined because they came up later. Moshe went out of the city, away from the Pharaoh, and spread out his hands to Adonai. The thunder, or the, the, um, the voices, the loud sounds, ended. Now it's interesting that the first place where this voices as thunder comes, the word in Hebrew is kolot. And usually kolot is written as kuf, uh, uh, Kof, Vav, Lamed, Vav, Tav. But for some reason, when Pharaoh is talking about being afraid of these voices, it eliminates both of these Vavs. This is a little anomaly in the Hebrew. Then, here in this verse, where it mentions that Moshe went out of the city away from Pharaoh and spread his hands to Adonai, the Kolot has one Vav introduced after the Lamed, but not both Vavs. So, very interesting uh, anomaly here. And the rain stopped pouring down on the earth. When Pharaoh saw that the rain, hail, and thunder had ended, he sinned still more by making himself more hard-hearted. Imagine the stubbornness of men's heart. He and his servants. This is what happens when we get full of ourselves. We make our hearts hard to receive the truth from God or from God's servants. Pharaoh was made hard-hearted, and he didn't let the people of Israel go, just as he had said through Moshe. Now this is where our Torah portion ends. Our Hof Torah is in Ezekiel 28-25, but I want to bring all of these themes of God's name and promises together in closing. Revelation 16.2 says, And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men who had the mark of the beast, and upon them who worshipped his image. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there was a great voice out of the temple of heaven. So this is the first plague. Now we're dealing with the seventh plague in the last days. After Yeshua catches up his bride, he, the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices. Why is it done? 
because Messiah Yeshua has come and gathered up all of his elect. So now there's nothing left to hold back, in essence, because up to this time the winds of strife have been held back from their full um, effect. And there was voices, here's that word, kolet, and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was never since men were upon the earth. This means that it was worse than even what Pharaoh experienced. So mighty an earthquake, and so great. And the great city was divided. What's the great city? Jerusalem. It's divided in three parts at this time. And the cities of the nations fall at this time. So this tells you the very time of the fall of Babylon. Now it refers to the fall of Babylon as one hour in, a, in another passage. And an hour, whenever you're unlocking Bible prophecy, you use a 360-day Jewish calendar. Um, as a day is like a year to the Lord, God always uses a day for a year principle when meeting out judgment. So one hour is 1 24th of a day, which means we would need to take 1 24th of a Jewish year, which is 360 days. And 1 20, 24th of a Jewish year comes out to be exactly the 15-day period between Rosh Hashanah, which is Yom Teruah, the day that he catches up his bride, and Sukkot, when he comes back down and tabernacles with men once again. That 15-day period during the fall holy days is when the fall of Babylon occurs, when there is no holy saints on the earth and the full wrath of God, as it's described, pours out upon the earth and destroys all trace of this false Babylonian system. It says the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell, indicative of the fall of Babylon. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, each stone weighing about a talent. Now a talent ranged from between 70 pounds and 100 pounds. So imagine if that hit anything, it's going to decimate it, including concrete, not just livestock and men. And men blasphemed God. Instead of having a repentant heart and praying for deliverance and forgiveness, they cursed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. So this gives us a little prophetic view at what this is hinting towards in our near future. Now in our Hof Torah, Ezekiel 28, I bring out just mainly verse 25, which says, Thus says the Lord God, When I shall have gathered the house of Israel from amongst the people, and when is the, the greater exile, or the ultimate exile? Or, I'm sorry, the ingathering, the greater ingathering in is when he comes back and gathers his people. So this is the period of the second coming that is speaking of. When I have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they are scattered, and shall be sanctified in them in the sight of the heathen, then shall they dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob. So the promise to restore the land comes after he gathers us. This is why they wouldn't recognize Yeshua as the Messiah, because this is one of the prophecies of the Messiah, that he will first gather back the exiles, bring them back to Israel, and then he will rebuild the temple, and he will set up his kingdom. And all of these things they are anxiously awaiting for. We know that our Jewish brothers focus and love Mashiach, more than anything, they're looking forward to the age of Mashiach to restore God's kingdom on this earth. But they are so careful to rightly divide the word that they're not going to put the title Mashiach on somebody who has not yet been Mashiach as king and reigning as king. So we can recognize Yeshua as the prophet like unto Moshe that was prophesied in Deuteronomy 18 and the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. And we who with spiritual eyes and spiritual ears by faith know him to be the same one who will return in the second coming sometimes slip and call him Mashiach in advance. But this is what's causing a problem when you're witnessing to, about Yeshua, especially with a pagan garb, to our Jewish brethren who know that no one has come and fulfilled the prophecies of Mashiach as of yet. And the prophecy goes on and says, they will dwell safely therein, speaking of the land of Israel, and they shall build houses and plant vineyards. Yea, they shall dwell with confidence when they have executed judgments upon all those that despise them round about them. And they shall know that I am Yahava, 
Once again, see how it correlates with the Torah portion? He introduces himself as yod heh vav -Hey, and even in the Torah portion that we're reading this week, it relates to the final ingathering of the saints and their deliverance and him revealing himself as yod heh vav -Hey. Now in the Brit Hadashah, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 7, 1 correlates with this. Paul says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. See, we might be in the world, but we're not to be of the world. We might be in Egypt, but we're not to be like Egypt, right, with all its idol worship. We might be engaging in business as and be a part of the Babylonian system now, but there will be a time where we are no longer able to be a part of the Babylonian system unless we take the mark of the beast. So we have to start pulling out of this false system now because we're unequally yoked with this false system. So this unequally yoked in the microcosm might be a relationship that we could be unequally yoked, and this is how this text is often used, but in the macrocosm, even within the system that we are living in, the kingdom that we're living in, we are unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion has light with darkness? They can't coexist. And what concord has Messiah with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Our bodies, he says, know ye not that your body is the temple of God. Therefore, there has no place for self-worship, self-exaltation, self-gratification. All of these things are different forms of self-pleasure, which is a form of idol in our life. So the temple of God, which our body has been redeemed for, can't coexist with these idols that we have subtly kept into our lives, even though we call ourselves believers. For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. I will shachin. That's the root for uh, shekinah. Glory. I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God. This is that reference to that promise. I will be their God and they shall be my people. What is he quoting here? Exodus 6. Our very Torah portion. Wherefore, come out from among them. See the correlation with the call to come out of Babylon. And be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not anything unclean. So people that try to tell you, oh, the law's been nailed to the cross. Go ahead, eat the way you want. Take unclean things into your body, into the temple of God. Even Paul is saying, don't. Don't have anything to do with the unbeliever or with the unclean things. And then God will receive you. And I will be a father to you. And you will be my sons and daughters. See, because who are we marrying? The son. It's the bride of Mashiach that he has chosen the bride for the son. So he's saying, I will be a father to you. And you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. This is the body of Messiah. So in closing, let us be encouraged. Let us put away all things unclean and impure. And let us put away all idols and anything that takes us away from God. And let us put away the, any ego and crucify all areas of self. All forms of selfishness, of power and control and manipulation and force. Let's get rid of that. That's not part of the character of God. Let's get rid of all self-glorification and excessive self-adornment. Let's get rid of the love of mammon and greed and any vain self-sufficiency that we think that we are able to protect ourselves or provide for ourselves. Any idol worship of pharmakia or reliance on man-made medicine, which is self-magic of today, and the false days of worship in sun worship, that have their origins in sun worship. Let's crucify all areas of self and return to the ancient paths, and let us claim the promises of God to be freed, delivered, and redeemed from sin, and draw near to God in a new and more intimate way, and look forward to all that He has planned for us in the land, Eretz Yisrael. For he has promised, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And do you know where Paul is quoting this from? He's not just making this up off the top of his head. He's quoting Isaiah, chapter 64, verse 3. And what comes right after Isaiah says, I has not seen, nor ear heard, what comes right after this that you don't get in the New Testament? It says, but if... We will keep your ancient ways, O oh God. We will be saved. 
So he gives the secret to being saved, to being delivered, to being redeemed, going back to the ancient past, keeping the ancient ways. Then I will not see or ear heard all that God has planned for us to reveal by the living Torah in the land, revealing the Torah and writing it upon our hearts and making us one with him so that we can draw near to him and he live eternally with him. This is the good news. Let's stand and close in prayer. Abba Father, we thank you so much for revealing your seven promises through Moshe in Exodus 6.6 6, and how they relate, relate to fulfilling your prophetic uh, word to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and how ultimately they point forward to our day and how you will fulfill these promises in us as the descendants of Israel if we will return to the ancient paths and live out your ancient ways and seek to be one with you in purity and holiness, Father. This is our prayer. We don't want to just have a head knowledge of intellectual ideas or theological theories or memorization of scripture without it being applied to our life and lived out in mind, body, and spirit. So Father, we pray for your power and your anointing through your Ruach to be overcomers and to be victorious in all the areas that you have revealed you want to recreate us back into your image, into beings of light and love that ultimately manifest as eternal life. We love you and thank you for this, Father, and we praise your holy name, and we ask your blessing upon all the saints in all the lands of their dispersion around the world. In your holy name we pray. Amen.